and I'd like to take some time here in mid-December to start doing some winter identification of some new trees to this channel. This one I've already added in the past, in 2019, in the fall, I added this one. This is the hackberry, the American hackberry. Um, it's got distinct layered bark that comes up in these obvious ridges that are um, well pronounced and separate from each other. And this is in the elm family, and I'm going to use this to uh, kick off a series on slippery elm and American elm. And um, both those elm trees have been affected by the Dutch elm disease, but they are not gone from the woods here in the mid-Ohio Valley. They're still quite common. Just take a close-up at this hackberry bark. Look at how that looks like a, almost like cardboard. And those layers are the same kind of layers we find in the elm trees, but let's take a look at an elm tree and we'll see the obvious difference. As I'm walking down this path here, there's an American elm. This one's a split trunk, so, you know, each tree is about a foot in diameter, and they kind of mesh together here at the bottom. And this bark also is in layers, but it doesn't create those pronounced ridges. They're more uh, wider ridges with flat tops. And if you can find a piece of this bark without harming the tree and just break a little bit off, like I just did, we don't want to take too much off the tree to do this identification, but this will make it very easy to tell if you have an American elm. We've got like an Oreo cookie with the brown cookie and the white filling in layers. I got another piece in my pocket I got a couple days ago from a larger tree that had fallen. You can see that right there, that obvious um, Oreo cookie texture. Let's resume this video. I had to get a better look at this, but um, right there at that angle, you can see the white filling in the Oreo cookie and the brown or dark brown cookie on either side of this bark. So these elm trees, the American elm, are easy to tell by that. They don't get that big because of what's called Dutch elm disease, which has affected many of the ornamental elms. They don't even sell them in landscape centers anymore. They haven't for years. But they used to be known as one of the most beautiful ornamental trees. And you can see this one. It's a little scraggly looking, but as you get up near the top, it has a beautiful form. It's very graceful as they get larger. Unfortunately, they don't get that large before they're afflicted by the Dutch elm disease, which is spread by a beetle, which can burrow into the bark. It's a native beetle. But the fungus came from another part of the world, and the beetle is a transmitter. So in this case, unlike the... Um, emerald ash borer where the actual beetle came from Asia. In this case, the beetles are native to America, but the fungus came from another part of the world from Asia and the beetle is now the transmitter and can cause these trees to not live a full life. They at once upon a time got very large, but in my lifetime, they've always been the smaller trees in the forest. This is a bottom land area at Fort Ancient State Memorial in Warren County, Ohio. We got a lot of uh, your typical bottomland trees, you got your sycamores, you got your white walnut or butternut, and a lot of um, understory here of invasive honeysuckle. And let's just take a moment to study a couple more uh, American elm trees. There's a lot of variability in the bark, especially on these younger trees. I got one right here that is actually fairly smooth. Got a little, a lot of little sprouts coming out here. These, 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 these branches are very fine. They're not thick at all. They're no thicker than a piece of spaghetti where you find the buds. Even on the larger trees, the uh, part where the leaves come out is very finely branched. Again, this is, it's got some little ridges here and if we're careful, we can break one off and see that Oreo cookie look without harming the tree. There we are right there. Right next to it's this one. It's like a wild, undisciplined teenager. An adolescent gone wild here with shaggy, all kinds of quirky ridges here. 
Again, with that Oreo cookie bark, so it's giving away the identity of an American elm, but boy, it looks undisciplined. Got poison ivy growing up it, which isn't uncommon in these bottomlands. But real corky ridges, almost looks like that hackberry tree that I showed a few minutes ago. But when you break the bark on the ridges of a hackberry, you don't get that layered cookie appearance. And here's one here. Again, this is an adolescent or a teenager. It's kind of undisciplined, but not as much as his next door neighbor here. Maybe a little bit at the bottom here. So again, there's our layered look. And that just helps us identify the tree. We don't want to make a habit out of breaking the bark off of any kind of tree. But it does help us identify these American elms. We're going to walk up the hill here and do some uh, introduction to the uh, slippery elm next. And one of the reasons I use this Fort Ancient State Memorial for a lot of these videos is it's close to home. It has a large variety of habitats. You can see in the background there is a large interstate bridge here in Warren County, Ohio. 300 feet above the river valley and we're on a ridge above that valley. And above where I did the footage for that um, American Elm a few minutes ago, we're getting some goofy weather today. Sun's playing hide and seek, the rain's coming and going. Let's walk down this hill. We're going to move on to Slippery Elm for a few minutes here. The reason I'm up here with these oaks and hickories is the leaf litter. If you want to identify Slippery Elm in the wintertime and you're not familiar with it, try to get in the right habitat and you'll start seeing some leaves that are much darker than the surrounding leaves on the ground. We've got one right here. The shape of these leaves is unique as well. But the uh, color of the slippery elm leaves in the wintertime when they've fallen to the ground, they've got a lot of silica in them, which is slow to decay. So they stick around and they're much darker than the surrounding leaves and much rougher. Let's see if we can get this to make a sound here. You may not hear that, but you can certainly feel it. Feels like sandpaper on these leaves and they're quite large. I pressed some a few days ago. We'll look at those in a few minutes. But as I come down this hill, it's going from light colored leaves to occasional dark colored leaves, like a milk chocolate color. We get down into this bottom land here. We're going to start seeing a lot more of those and the forest becomes almost dominant with slippery elm. We'll start again in just a minute. And we've come about a quarter mile down the hill into the bottom land of the Little Miami River here. We're far away from the water. This may have been a river, valley, you know, close to the river at one time, but we're far removed from the actual floodplain. But it's a lowland, and the soil stays moist, and we have some bottomland trees here, including some sycamores and some butternut. So we got our, our, our light brown leaves. Those are mostly sycamore at this point on the hike. Up the hill, they were mostly oaks. The hickories decay quickly, so what I was comparing to earlier was mostly chinkapin, white, and um, red oak. Here we've got our tan, light brown color of the sycamore leaves, and then a whole bunch of darker colored leaves from these slippery elm trees. So these elm trees are known for their uh, providing good habitat for a very desirable uh, wild mushroom called the morel. So if you're looking for a place to look for mushrooms in the spring and you're hiking in the winter, start looking for these darker colored leaves in contrast to the sycamores and other trees that might grow in this bottom land. And then you'll know you're in the right habitat for morels. And yes, I have seen them around here. I'm not going to give away my stashes. I don't eat them, but I know where they grow. And um, this is a nature preserve. They're not allowed to collect back here. Here's our slippery arm elm bark. Almost resembles that of an ash tree. But the braids or the, the branches and the furrows go many, many inches without converging. So we got one right here and it continues on for 16, 20 inches before they meet again. It's a very straight tree and about a foot foot and a half in diameter and that's about as much as we're going to find back here most of these are starting to die when they get bigger than that but these leaves 
I pressed one a couple days ago when they haven't been rained on. They're quite a bit lighter, almost like a lighter colored chocolate instead of a dark chocolate. They have that obvious abrasive feel. And I can actually scuff this tin foil. I'll do that and just pause for a second. So this pressed slippery elm leaf, which is about four inches long, was rough enough to scuff this tin foil. It won't show up in the video here. But as you touch these leaves, especially when they're dry, but even when they're wet, you can feel the silica in the leaf. It's a very rough texture. We'll get back to these trees in the spring when they have their leaves and their fruits in May. But for now, the darker colored leaves on the uh, leaf on the leaves in the leaf litter are a giveaway, and the straight trunk of this uh, slippery elm tree is a giveaway. There's another one right here with the bark that is got some furrows in it but they go long distances without converging and that's a giveaway for this slippery elm tree the branching is is unique and the buds are unique but they're not often in view so i'm trying to use the features that you'll find while you're hiking but again look at those leaves as we're hiking here we've got these dark chocolate brown slippery elm leaves compared to a sycamore leaf it's a dead giveaway I'm going to look at a dead uh, sycamore, uh, super elm tree in just a minute here and see what that um, ash, excuse me, the elm uh, disease can cause when the uh, elm beetles get their, their hands on it. Well, our skies have gone from gray to partly cloudy to uh, blue in the last hour on this hike today. Makes it easier to look at the crowns of these trees when they're not being backlit by the gray but by the blue. We've got some slippery elm trees here that are long gone and still standing but dead. And this one right here, you can see the tunnels that the bark beetle made. So again, bark beetle is native to North America, but the pathogen or the fungus that has killed these trees is not, and that is why a lot of them are not reaching full size. Guidebook says two to three feet in diameter. I don't see any back on this hike more than 16 inches that are still alive. So like a lot of trees, they can survive when they're young, but when these pathogens get a hold of them as adults, they don't. So this one is dead and broken. Right behind it is one that is dead, but not completely broken yet. It still has some branches left. And that bark, which again resembles that of a tulip poplar or an ash, but the, the ridges go long distances without converging. It's peeling off in large flakes. It's called slippery elm because the inner bark is very um, gooey and chewy and actually has medicinal values. Used in native cultures and is still used today. But one way we can remember slippery elm is just how easily the bark on the dead tree slips off the trunk I and mean, this is coming off in huge chunks you got one over here that's still alive and this one's a good 16 18 inches in diameter so they can get that big and again our leaf litter is a dark chocolate color when wet and just a little lighter when dry and we'll do a quick comparison with the elm leaf litter from the american elm and not the slippery elm this is one of the larger trees in this park. It's full height and it's still alive, but it's straight. Got a poison ivy vine growing up the side of it. That's not uncommon in these bottomland woods. But the leaf litter is the giveaway on this tree. And we're on a section of trail here. Where again, it looks like it's the, these are chocolate chip. Um, cookie trees with the uh, color of these leaves, a cocoa tree almost. And what I have here is both specimens, slippery elm and American elm. And we can take it, do a direct comparison of the bark and the leaves and put the wraps on this winter study. Here's our American elm, again, a corky bark with flat top ridges. And those adolescent ones I showed earlier were really, some of them were really wild and crazy with the ridges going everywhere. And some were a little more um, well-groomed. Our slippery elm is usually very well-groomed and fa usually fairly straight. And again, these are flat top ridges here. 
And when you break the bark open, I found some dead trees earlier. You get a layered appearance, but it doesn't have that dark and light banding. This is the slippery elm bark right here, and it has banding, but it's all the same color. And there's our American elm with that Oreo cookie appearance. But again, this whole forest here is elm, either slippery elm or American elm, and you can just tell by how much darker the leaf litter is. On the right is the leaves from the slippery elm. Again, that cocoa color. And the ones on the left are from the American elm, and they have that offset appearance. So one side is a little, has a, has a it, it's, it's got this heart-shaped appearance, but one side of the heart is a little bigger than the other on the slippery elm and on the, excuse me, on the American elm. You also have that same offset appearance on the slippery elm. And this specimen here was pressed in its flat, but this is how they look when you find them in the woods. They're all curled up, but they're, again, one side of the bottom of the leaf comes down further than the other. Just for comparison, I do have a beech leaf in the bottom of the screen here on the right side, just below my pocket knife. That's from an American beech. Very similar in color, and the veins are very similar to that of the American elm. But our American beech does not have that double-toothed edge, but the American elm has double teeth. One big tooth with several small teeth between, and so does the slippery elm. So slippery elm wouldn't be, leaf would not be confused with a beech leaf, but American elm could if you don't take the time to look at the details. And this is the winter study of two species of elm that are common on these moister bottomland soils. And we'll continue on with these in the spring when they've got some leaves and fruits to look at.